On today's High Watt Soundbite, we're going on a tour. Well, I pulled a classic on a rainy Saturday afternoon last weekend. I came down to the studio with the intention of spending maybe 30 or 40 minutes doing some tidy up work. Well, I swear I didn't resurface out of the studio for another eight hours. And when I did, yeah, this place has never been this clean. I don't think it was this clean the day I built it. So this totally inspired me to want to stop everything and do a bit of a high watt lab studio tour, particularly before I trash the place again. Over the last year and a half, I've been sharing different aspects of what I get up to in the studio, but never have we put it all together in one package and specifically talked about the gear that I use. So for today's session, as opposed to me picking up the camera and wandering around and making everyone dizzy, I came in this morning and I captured some video of all of my critical pieces. So I just thought we'd take a few minutes today and tour High Watt Labs together. Let's have a look at the gear that I get up to using every day. Well, the very first stop in the absolute hub of High Watt Labs is this console. This is a Sterling Modular Plan D console. And about the most important thing I can say about this console is, why did I wait so long to invest in it? This is one of the huge mistakes I made in many of the project studios that I had in the past is, you know, I went to so much effort to get the acoustics and everything else right in that room. And I just dropped the ball on the, on the actual mainframe console. I never understood just how much value a console like this can bring to a studio. Probably the biggest benefit of having this console has been posture for me. This is absolutely corrected decades of poor posture sitting in front of computer screens, particularly as I got a little bit older and I transitioned into a progressive lens for glasses. Many of you are going to relate to what I'm talking about, but if those computer screens are sitting on your desk and they're too high, when you're wearing progressive lenses, as you're well aware, you have to tilt your head back so that you can see through the correct part of your glasses to read the screen. Well, this created havoc in my world for years because I would find myself spending hours of every day like this, right? Terrible posture. Well, this console, like many of the Sterling modular designs, has a lowered rear shelf that allows you to drop all your computer screens down. Yeah, this has been a game changer in correcting my posture and all kinds of issues, shoulders, neck, back. Now I get to sit at my desk and look at my two monitors with ease. No longer am I having to strain for long periods of time. Okay, so next stop and one of the most important stops, power. I'm talking about AC power. Over a year ago, I shared a session called Tech Room, Studio Power Conditioning Done Right. Well, that's a very dated session on this channel, but it's full of awesome information about the system that I use. I choose to use what's called a true online UPS, uninterruptible power supply. A true online UPS is a double conversion UPS. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that device is converting the AC that's coming in from the grid, from, from the wall, and it converts it to DC, holds a charge on the battery system, and then has an inverter that inverts it back to AC. Well, there's a magic process that happens right there. In doing that conversion, I just isolated my studio from the grid. All of the noise and the chaos that goes on in a typical power grid system in your neighborhood, you just disconnected yourself and isolated yourself from that whole bunch of business. Just for that one reason, these things are worth their weight in gold. Furthermore, they literally provide perfect power for all your gear. Well, one of the challenges of these online UPSs is they make a racket. They have loud fans in them and all kinds of stuff. So when I built my studio, I had my electrician come and do some modifications so that I could put that UPS in the furnace room, which is a couple of rooms behind me, and wire the output directly under my console. It's literally like magic. I don't hear it, I don't see it, but it provides ultra clean power for all of my gear. So I've got three switchable power bars that everything in my studio connects to. So to start my day in the studio, I just simply come in and fire these three switches up. The first switch that I throw when I come in the studio is that lower unit, which feeds all of my amplifiers, all of self-powered speakers and standalone amps. That first power bar is not part of that UPS system. 
There's no reason for amplifiers and those big kind of heavy duty systems to be on that UPS. I reserve the output of that UPS for all of my mission critical equipment. I don't include amplifiers in that. If I'm in the middle of working and I lose power, I don't care if I lose my amps. It's just the mission critical stuff that we can't lose power to. So in addition to that power bar feeding all my amps, I've got one more that feeds all my non-mission critical stuff. And the final bar, the one on the top, is the one that's fed off that UPS. The computer, hard drives, peripherals, mic preamp, mic power supply, Eurorack, everything that's important to me, audio interface, all of that mission critical stuff is getting super clean power from that online UPS. So awesome. It's nothing like being right in the heat of work and boom, everything shuts down except everything that you're working on, right? And in this particular system, I probably got 25 minutes of running everything off that UPS. So plenty of time to save and safely shut down, right? Now, one more thing before we move away from power. You know, in my own studio, probably like many of you, I like to operate my daily workflow on nothing but SSDs. I don't like to have any spinning hard drives in my room. But of course, when it comes to backup, there's no way I can afford SSDs for all my backup drives, right? Well, for the first couple of years in the studio, every time I needed to fire up one of those backup drives, I would literally get out of my chair, walk around the front of the console, get on the floor, reach down and flip a switch. I finally got my act together and I mounted a couple of power bars on the very outside of my last rack. Well, now whenever I need access to those spinning hard drives, I simply just slide over and flip the switch on the appropriate power bar to bring all those hard drives to life. And when I'm finished backing up, I just simply eject them from the desktop and power them all back down again. Yeah, I'm not sure why it took me two years to solve that one. Next up is my main audio interface. For me, that's a Universal Audio Apollo 8. And at the end of that Thunderbolt chain, I've got an Octo Satellite as well for the extra horsepower. Total of 12 cores, I believe. So my main rig is a screaming 2019 iMac. It's got 64 gigs of RAM in it. This thing just never runs out. It doesn't matter how big the session is. Between this computer and the 12 cores of, of that Universal Audio system, there's so much mixing power in this, it's sort of crazy. Even at 96K, this thing just screams. It's awesome. Well, in addition to my main DAW and audio interface, I like to have a completely independent, separate capture machine, I call it. Often I'll use it in mastering for sample rate conversion and all kinds of different uses. In my case, I've got an older version of Pro Tools running on my laptop, which is connected to an Mbox Pro for the interface. I love having two completely independent Pro Tool systems. Yeah, it just opens up options in such a good way. And some of the software that I use every day, well, for me personally, that's Pro Tools Ultimate, of course. And, oh man, Vienna Ensemble Pro. If you don't know about this program, this is something that I use to host all of my virtual synths. And what an incredibly efficient program this is to handle that job. In a different session, for sure, I'm gonna to have to get further into how I use VN Ensemble Pro, but that program is absolutely critical to my workflow and something that communicates directly with Pro Tools brilliantly. And just an arsenal of plugins, of course. Everything Waves, everything Universal Audio, Sound Toys, Fab Filter, you know, it's just some of the best sounding tools we've ever had access to. Some of these plugins sound better than the device they're actually modeling. It's a good time to be alive in audio. All right, next stop, studio monitors. For me, that's a pair of KRK Expose E8Bs paired with a KRK V12S sub. That's the old school sub. It's a big rectangular rig, still a 12 inch driver, but just a much heavier and bigger kind of unit. Of course, over the years, I've used all kinds of different monitors, right? NS10s in the early days, graduated to a, a Proax Studio 100 that I used exclusively for well over a decade. And then one day, I heard the KRK E8Bs and everything changed for me. This monitor is the one for me personally. What are single-handedly the best sounding studio monitors? In my experience, the ones you're most familiar with. For 14 years, I've only had two monitor options available to me in my studio. These KRKs with that sub and my 
all-time favorite Oritone. I'm talking about the little mono cube speaker. This is a speaker that I learned how to mix on in the 80s and I still use it today. Every single mix, I reference that Oritone in mono. What that tiny little four and a half inch speaker can tell you about the balance of your mix is just priceless. And some of you might laugh, but I power this Oritone with a Studer A68, one of the most sought after audio amplifiers ever made. This thing is pure class A and it's driving a four and a half inch Oritone. I love it. And for my monitor control, I'm using a PreSonus Central Station and it's remote, which works really well for my own personal setup. When I built this studio, I made a very conscious decision to go stereo. I had no interest in setting up another surround studio. It's just in my own experience, 99.9% .9 of the work that I do professionally is in stereo. Another piece of mission critical gear to my daily workflow is this control surface. This Avid Artist Control and Artist Mix have literally eliminated the mix window from Pro Tools for me. If I thought I'd have to give this console up, I'd start freaking out a little bit. For anybody who's mixing professionally, I strongly encourage you to be working on a control surface. You know, this isn't the only one. There's many of them out there, but there's something about disconnecting your brain and that visual, right? And having tactile feel and using your ears and your fader to set levels. There's something very magical about that. Well, let's spend a few minutes talking about outboard gear and one of my favorite all-time studio effects, the Lexicon PCM42. This is a killer sounding delay that's got so many unique features. You know, it's got a soft limiter on the input, so it has a very unique way of feeding back and a very warm way of feeding back. It's got killer distortion capabilities when you fry the front end of that thing. It just sounds crushed on the output. I love it. Hands down, my favorite single channel delay line ever. I just can't live without that device, no question. And one of my all-time favorite effects in the studio, my Eventide H3500. This particular unit is fully loaded with all the presets and all the sample time and everything. The Eventide H3500 is an absolutely epic piece of gear and something that pretty much is heard on everything that I've mixed in the last 35 years. Just been a go-to device for decades. Now we get to talk about my electrics world. You know, the Warp Factory, the Mofex and the Filter Factory. This is a little Canadian company that built some incredibly cool pieces of hardware back in the day. I was one of the lucky ones. I remember jumping on eBay and buying all of these units for under 130 bucks each, I think. I had no idea at that time what kind of return I was gonna get on that investment. I'm still using all three of these units today. Sort of crazy. And speaking of mission critical, I've got a pair of API 7600 channel strips. This is the unit that predates what they're currently calling their channel strip. Has a little bit more functionality, most of which I don't use. So I've got a pair of these 7600s in the horizontal configuration. You know, the API console has just always been my go-to console. The 550A equalizer is hands down, in my view, the best sounding EQ I've ever heard. So having a pair of them, I use these input strips to record just about everything in my studio, from microphones to you know, keyboards to my Euro rack, whatever it is, it gets slammed through the API. And for good reason, these things sound so, so good. And speaking of microphones, I actually don't have a large collection available to me in my own studio. When I need to go and do some kind of serious recording, almost always I'm gonna to go to an outside facility and I'm gonna rely on their collection. But in my own studio, oh man, I've got a Mojave MA200. This is a vacuum tube mic that has a really killer Jensen transformer on its output. This mic and, and API combo paired up is just killer sounding. Probably 95% of what I record in this studio is done with this MA200. But yeah, of course I've got like 58s, 57s, Got a couple of pencil mics and another couple of choices for condensers. 95% of what I use is that. And synthesizers and other voice generation. Well, probably like many of you, a lot of that is handled with virtual synths these days, but I've still got my hardware, right? I, I've got my virus. I love using the synth and I use it all the time. And one of the single best investments that I've made in the last 10 years is in this little Eurorack synth. This little modest setup that I have is so unbelievably powerful. 
there's no way that we can even touch the surface of that thing today. So we're definitely gonna come back and do a whole session on this Eurorack rig. This thing is one of the most cool and creative sound sources that I've ever played with in my life. You almost don't even need to know what you're doing on this thing. You could just start patching stuff and making sounds. I mean, it's like a great big Lego kit for audio guys. So no question, we're gonna bust in and do a whole session on that thing. In recent sessions, I've been talking about my patch bay and how that thing is handling a whole bunch of connections for me just through normaling. There's a technology inside those patch bays that allow them to be sort of automatically connected to the row below them, so to speak. So when I build a custom installation like I did in my own studio, a custom production workspace for myself, oh man, I'll go into that patch bay and I'll totally modify it. I'll make that patch bay make sense for my personal workflow. If I was building this studio where I had to build it and, and consider other engineers coming in using it, I would never follow this kind of design. I would probably have to have three or four of these patch bays to make sense of the equipment that's in this room. Well, thank you very much for sitting in on today's session. Can you tell that I love talking about gear? Oh yeah, this never gets old.